What's happening with the supercapacitor perpetual light project, I hear you ask? Well, it's uh, it continues to be an interesting journey. So originally, uh, and I'll link the video up here, but originally I put in a four Farad supercapacitor and was overjoyed to see it working, but not so overjoyed when about 15, 20 minutes later, it stopped working. So uh, then I swapped in one of these. This is a 30 Farad supercapacitor and was getting probably around the 40 to 50 minutes and then I put two supercapacitors in there, uh, both 30 farad, and was getting probably around the two hour mark, which isn't so bad. Um, and uh, I started, uh, I think in the original video, I started talking about maybe winding back the processing speed of the PFS154s, which we see here. This PFS154, the original one, is operating at around about 500 kilohertz, so galloping along really for the job that it's supposed to do. But I managed to find a way of winding back uh, the processor, and this is an example here. This is running at 17 kilohertz, which I think is astonishing. So uh, I'm going to, um, at the end of this video, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a software journey as to how that actually happens, because I think that's important. But then woke up in a cold sweat at about 2 a.m. one morning thinking, hey, the problem really isn't the processor. It's these guys here. This is a test bed, which um, I've just got some 1206 LEDs here. And uh, I don't even remember the size of that resistor, but it's probably draining a fair bit of power. In fact, I'll hook this up and find out just how much power is it draining at 1.9 volts. The processor itself isn't registering, uh, not surprisingly, because it's 17 kilohertz. Come on, nothing much is happening. Uh, but if I put this into 200 milliamps and then start it, yeah, so it's around about, around about one milliamp being drained by that, um, the combination of the processor and the lights themselves. So I don't know whether that's significant or not, but I do know that we should be able to uh, reduce it. So that's uh, the first order of business is to have a look at the original 5050s that uh, I used for this project and uh, and take it off the test bed and get to perhaps uh, the sort of LED system that it's most likely to be using in its final uh, incarnation. So just a reminder, you can see the three little LEDs in there. There is a bit of a cutout, which you can just see in this corner when I cover up that light. There you go. And that indicates the uh, ground side. So VCC coming in here. So let's have a look and test those three LEDs. So we've got, yep, and the middle, yep, and the end. Yep, yeah, no worries. So um, yeah, that's how it works. And in the previous incarnations, well, I'll just I'll just draw it actually and show you what I have been doing and what I need to do. It is different. So here's the chip, the uh, LED chip. That's the five hundred five zero, and uh, there's a little notch on the corner which indicates ground. So the AVR version of the candle with the A tiny thirteen had a uh, a signal coming in which actually covered two pins because the, a, the A2013 only has two PWM outputs uh, and that's part of the reason why I'm using the PFS154. So, uh, so we've got a signal coming in this way to two of these and then another signal coming in from another pin to, uh, to this one here. And then all of these were connected up uh, and then out to ground. So that's the old version and I don't really have any that aren't encased in uh, hot glue and this sort of Fresnel lens system here. Uh, but you can see that I've got the, on this old PCB, I've got a slow and a fast signal coming out. And what I used to do here was generally put the slow signal to two of these LEDs and the fast ramping signal to the third one uh, to create a pretty reasonable candle, actually pretty happy with it. But anyway, that's the old one. In the new system, because of the way the Paduk set up, what I'm going to do is provide one wire to all of these. And this is my VCC coming in on this side. And then on this side, we've got 
because it syncs current and doesn't source current, we've got three outputs going to three separate um, uh, pins on the uh, on the PFS154, and each of these has their own separate PWM. So I can actually vary the light here a lot more than than this one. So so that's a major advantage of the PFS154, and the other one, of course, is being able to operate at such a low um, clock speed. So this one I've got down to 128 uh, kilohertz and may be able to get lower with, with what, ironically, with what I've learnt from this, but uh, this one I've got down to 17 kilohertz, which, uh, which is amazing. Uh, but anyway, let's get this hooked up as per this wiring diagram and then we can replace the, the one that's here with the 1206s and maybe reduce that uh, power requirement even further to give the super caps a chance of going further into the night. Hungry Hippo here. This did turn out to be a 2.2K resistor. So what I've put on here is a pot, variable pot to 2K. And um, then I've got VCC coming out of the stable jewel thief. And, uh, and then that's just linking up through that pot into the three LEDs at the top here and then out through the three pins on the PFS154 that sync current. So if I cover up this, there we go, that's nice. I'm not seeing an awful lot of candly action at this level. Let's just get a bit closer. Mm, could be interesting. So, do we see variation? See a lot of sparkling. Probably have to uh, play a little bit more with that code to make sure that it's, um, it is a bit candlier than that. It looks pretty steady too the camera it is a little more variation to the naked eye which is uh, which is good so um what i'll do now is i'll put this on the windowsill and see how it survives uh it is there's a bit of sun about it today so uh, i'll give it a chance for these guys to charge up and uh, and then what i'll also do is i'll switch to the computer and show you how i got the processor this processor running at 500 kilohertz down to this process of running at just 17 kilohertz and uh, and you know every little bit helps to uh, to keep the power requirements down here is the code for the fake candle and uh, nothing has much changed from previous versions uh, so i won't spend an awful lot of time going through it and you can also you know maybe go back to some of the previous videos to have a look at what all this stuff means but the big breakthrough recently has been the changing of the clock speed. So the last function down the bottom here is the, uh, what's called the startup code to set up and calibrate the system clock. And uh, if you have a look at the GitHub repository, for example, code, you'll see that uh, they mostly have things like auto init sys clock uh, will be the function that uh, initiates the system clock and it'll just choose the appropriate one. And then you've got auto calibrate the sys clock for the target voltage. And uh, I've changed those to PDK set sys clock. Uh, that's this one here, set sys clock to the ILRC. That's the low clock, the low speed clock. And furthermore, to divide that by four so that it gets it down quite low. And then calibrate that clock to, uh, in this case, I've got 17 kilohertz at, uh, at three volts. So um, once that's all programmed, then all you need to do is to just put that into the chip and uh, you can see that it's compiled fine and it's calibrated the system clock at 17, or it's tried to calibrate it at 70 kilohertz and it's actually got 16.835. So if we change this to say 50, uh, which is probably a more sensible number, and we save that, uh, and then we go back and do this again, it should change that calibration. So it's trying 50 and it's outside the range. So 
what we'll do is we'll change our div 4, which is pretty slow. We'll just change it to ILRC and save that. And that should give us success at calibrating that. And there it goes. So uh, I'm looking at 50 kilohertz and it's actually calibrated it to 51345. So um, we might now have a look at what difference that makes in terms of the, um, the actual amount of uh, energy or current or whatever you like to say, we'll do it as current uh, that is required by that processor running at those two different speeds. We'll go for full throttle and then uh, running the same program and then we'll go for let's say uh, 50 kilohertz and see if that makes a difference. So we've got our couple of PFS154 chips here. Both of them going full throttle, providing PWM to three channels, uh, simulating the candle project, not outputting to an LED at the moment. So we're just going to be measuring the current draw of the chip itself. This one here is running at one megahertz, and this one here we have tweaked to run at 50 kilohertz. So you would expect that there would be a current difference between the two. Let's get the one megahertz one plugged in. So if we go into milliamp mode, and connect that up. So that's reporting around about somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6 milliamps. And uh, then if we go to the one that's running at 50 kilohertz, so we'll plug that one in. And uh, yes, you can see that that's dropped down to around about 0.1. Let's actually go into the microamp measuring range. So about 180, 190 microamps, around about a third of what the requirements are for this one. So that would become significant if they were sleeping, but I think it's reasonably significant even when they're galloping along uh, doing this PWM. Uh, I've put the project on the windowsill and I'll keep an eye over the next uh, couple of weeks to see how it goes charging up those super caps, but also what the discharge time is now that we've changed the LED over and also we've been able to get the um, the chip to run uh, uh, slower than the, uh, the standard one. Uh, that's the circuit working for this week. See you next week.